I wasn't in a place where I felt like I could grow. And I was like, what's the next step? When you start to think like at a job, like I would do it this way, or it should be done this way, you know, or, you know, I really, I wish it was being handled this way. If you start to think of that more and more and your experience level is there, then you're like, okay, wait, why don't I actually do it this way? on my own. It's all about prioritizing. Once you get to having a hundred tasks to do a day, you're not going to finish every single one. So it's really just having the priorities in place and then systems that support that. Welcome back to the Transaction Care Podcast. My name is Lillian Hernandez, aka Lily Like the Flower, because we are learning and growing together. So this week we have somewhat of a recurring guest. <laughs> Allison Kirak is the owner of Stitched Real Estate LLC, a full service transaction coordination and TC coaching company. She got her real estate license in 2018 and has now been a full-time transaction coordinator for over three years. Allison specializes in transaction coordination services in the state of Texas, where she has closed over 900 transactions, real estate transactions, congratulations. And with her experience on the agent, assistant, and TC sides of the business, Allison is passionate about providing exceptional customer service and helping other coordinators make a name for themselves in this industry. Allison resides in Dallas, Texas with her husband and two corgis, Luca and Duke. So welcome back again, Allison. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. So as many of you may or may not know, we did an interview on YouTube. We both have YouTube channels. That's how I came across Allison's content. And as life and technology would have it, there were some sound issues. So we are here again to give this another try. So thank you again, Allison, for being here. (laughs) And let's just jump straight into it. So let's break down your journey. Like why real estate? How did you get here? Was this always a passion of yours? Let's, Let's break that journey down. Yeah, absolutely. So I feel like I had a really organic journey to get to where I'm at today. I went to school in college for marketing, but to me, maybe because I went to school in Oklahoma, I don't know. I didn't really hear about like big advertising agencies or anything. So I always thought, you know, marketing means sales and there was no sales degree, at least at my school at that time. And so I was like, I'll just get a marketing degree, but I know I'm going to work in sales. And I didn't really care what type of sales. I will say my, both of my step parents are in sales in like the medical world. So I did kind of look to them in those careers as like some type of sales. And, but I really didn't know what exactly I was going to do. And I ended up accepting a job in insurance sales. I remember I got it like October of my senior year. So then I was like, just chilling, you know, in college, like I already got a job. Like I was right. so I literally, the only thing that was stressful is I had to study and get my insurance license. So that was like stressful. Cause I didn't know anything about that, but I got that. I was so excited. And then it's like now like a running joke between me and my husband. It's like, I say I lasted eight weeks at that job. He says I lasted six. So like, I'm like, maybe the truth somewhere in the middle, like seven, <laughs> um, but Safe to say it, the corporate insurance world was definitely not for me. And I was really struggling because I'm sure anybody who's felt like a failure in a job, you know, you've only been doing it for a little bit. Plus it was, I was my first job out of college and it's like, I really can't even do this, you know, but I mean, I... now looking back, it was just like, not the right work environment, not the right thing, not the right people to be around at the time. So it was all meant to be, but basically when I was kind of struggling with that a few weeks in, I had lunch with my stepmother-in-law who was a realtor. She still is. And she kind of encouraged me that if I wasn't happy, that I should meet with her broker broker that real estate, she thought I'd be good at it and might be a good fit for me. And so I kind of now had that in the back of my head and I ended up meeting with them right around the time I quit the insurance job. And I was like, okay, well now I'm going to do real estate sales. And I spent the rest of the summer studying for my exam. And luckily, because I didn't have a job or anything else at the time, I was able to study really hard and pass them all within like three months. Nice. And so, yeah, then I was like, you know, fresh out of college pretty much. And I was just like a brand new, like baby faced real estate agent. But yeah, so, I mean, I had some influences in my life who were in like sales and like real estate, but it was never really something that like, oh, this is going to be the path for me. So. Right. Yeah. And that was actually my next question. Like, had you had any other outside influence in terms of even just entrepreneurship? Because entering, I think a lot of the, the misconception with real estate is that 
oh, you work for yourself and people give you business. You know, it just, you sign up and then here's a piece of paper. There's, you know, call these numbers, you'll get money. And you're fresh out of college. The world is intimidating. You're like, yeah, I'll take this insurance job. (laughs) (laughs) And then it turns into actually now this new opportunity with real estate. So what was going on in those first few months of transitioning after you've gotten your license? Yeah, so absolutely. That's something I totally agree with. And I think it's a huge misconception about real estate. And but for me, the misconception I had more was like, oh, I work for my broker, which is like, you know, that's not true. You know, like I'm actually owning my own business. And maybe just because I was so young, it was hard for me to wrap my head around that. But I see a lot of real estate agents even today who I feel like have that mindset, which is like, no, you're an independent contractor and it's on you to even if they give you leads or they have a monthly meeting you go to or something like you don't work for this person. Like, you know, you work for yourself. And I still feel like some realtors have a hard time wrapping their head around that. And that's definitely where I was at. I did it for about a full year. And then before I started looking at other options, but I would say almost that entire time, I probably never viewed it as owning my own business, which was a huge issue. But I think it's common misconception in the industry and then also being so young. But yeah, at the time, I didn't really have anybody who was an entrepreneur, you know, like I said, I had my stepmother-in-law who was a great like mentor and resource for me, but I didn't really probably ever dig in with her about like the behind the scenes of the business more of like, you know, oh, you're doing this and this. I think I just saw her as like already successful. And I was like, oh, I hope to get there one day. But I probably should have been asking her, you know, how are you getting more clients? How are you like running the business side of it? But I just had so many questions about like, what is this document? What does this mean? Okay, they said this, what should I say? You know, because you don't learn those things when you study for the exam. So it was like, she was so helpful for me in that way. But looking back, I should have been asking bigger picture questions. So yeah, I was definitely not viewing it that way when I was doing it. Yeah. And, and that kind of makes me wonder why there isn't some sort of like business aspect to it, to get your license. Because imagine, imagine just the liability of us coming in like fresh out of college, first job, and now you're responsible for someone's first purchase or investment, millions, hundreds and thousands of dollars. And Totally. It's not to say that the education you're getting isn't irrelevant, but at the same time, it's like, I've noticed that pattern with a lot of us, myself included, just jumping mm-hmm. into the business world with no foundation. And yeah. right, it goes down to <laughs> what is this paper when there's a yeah. like hundred million things going on in the background, you're just focused on like, well, item number seven, a on the contract. Yeah. Exactly. You're so bogged down. You can't even focus. So So now you're in the real estate industry, you're working uh, with your stepmother-in-law. Had you closed a deal as a realtor or were you still just in the background doing things? So my first year, I closed about nine or 10 deals. Oh, wow. So it was pretty like successful for a rookie year, but the brokers I was at gave out a lot of leads. So it was almost all leads I got, you know, which then I had to pay like a huge split on, but I was still just super excited. Mm -hmm. And towards the end of the year, I was kind of thinking, you know, still it ended up not being like that much income, especially for someone who was young, didn't have a lot of savings, you know, didn't already have like a nest egg or like, you know, just paying rent and like not a partner or something like that to help support you. So I kind of started to, I was always worried about that. So I kind of started to think like, is there anything else I could do? You know, like this is really hard and I'm having a struggle to support myself, like, and learn everything at the same time. Like what else is out there? And I had listened to a podcast and I heard someone who said it was someone who was a successful agent now. And they said they started out as an assistant. And I was like, oh, I didn't even really know people did that. Cause like, I certainly couldn't afford an assistant, you know, right. I'm like, can't afford my rent. So I was like, what? And so I kind of started learning and it's funny. TC still had not come across my desk, but like real estate assistant, or, you know, people who work at a brokerage, like front office manager, that kind of stuff. I was like, oh, this could maybe be a good way for me to learn more and get a steady paycheck. Because those were my two pain points where, you know, I was doing well, but it was very up and down. And sometimes a lot of commissions were still relatively small. And then also 
I had a question every 45 seconds. Like, what is this? What is this? Okay. I got three transactions on my belt. Oh, great. Now we're doing a condo. I've never done that before. You know? So it's like, Oh, it felt like it was like always something. Always so getting pushed back to the starting line. Yeah. Right. And so it's like, I was like, okay, this is kind of something that could solve my two pain points. And then, you know, figure it out later if I want to go back and be an agent again or something. And so I started working for um, a high producing agent in the area as their assistant. I went to an office every day. I had a salary and I did a lot of, I actually did the TC work, but then I also did all the admin work. So I did, you know, ordering marketing materials, answering the phone, picking up the mail, sending stuff out, helping, you know, with the social media. So a lot of stuff encompassed in it. And I learned a ton. And then we eventually kind of twisted my title from executive assistant to licensed marketing and transaction coordinator. And, you know, my background was in marketing. So I was like, okay, this is kind of perfect. But as time went on in that, I I just got more and more like, I wish I could just do the transactions all day. Okay. (laughs) And a lot of TCs I talk to, they are like, you know, they don't like doing the marketing or the admin stuff and they just want to focus on the transactions. And I became more and more that way. And that kind of slowly built itself into looking at, okay, what if I just did transactions full time? And like, what does that look like? And that's, you know, I'd heard of a transaction coordinator at this point, worked with some on other sides of deals and stuff, um, but I still wasn't that familiar with it. And so then I kind of started researching, you know, what does that look like? And then trying to figure out, was that something I want to go off on my own or work for a big company, you know, as a transaction coordinator, and it's going to be similar. It's like in office style or brokerage. And so kind of just exploring different options. And then in May, 2020, I decided to quit the assistant job and start working full-time as a transaction coordinator. I say full-time, I was an independent contractor, but pretty much, you know, doing full-time transaction coordinating for a company as a contractor. So it kind of all just naturally, I feel like that's why I say I feel like it's an organic journey. Like I had some small influences, but I really kind of just like found my footing on and on until I got to the point where I'm at now, where I decided to start my own company and just fully be in control of my TC work. So. Yeah, no, I love that. And thank you for sharing because I think a lot of people get stuck in positions that they're not happy with because they don't know how to not necessarily get out of it, but explore, you know, and a few things that you brought up that I, I'm glad you said was that, what are my pain points, Mm -hmm. you know, and what is suiting me? I have this experience in marketing. Let me go be a marketing coordinator and an admin assistant. Let me jump into these different roles and see what suits me best. And Mm -hmm eventually it manifested into your, you know, stitched real estate. But before that, I think for anyone out there that is curious about entrepreneurship or working from home, because I think it starts with, I just want to work from home. I'll do anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but behind that is pretty much everything Allison just said. She was working various jobs, different positions within companies. She didn't even know what a TC was. And then when she discovered like, oh, I actually enjoy this. Let me hone in on these skills and this, take this and quit and just start fresh. And some would say that's an overnight success, <laughs> but <laughs> then we don't, they don't factor in like, well, my leap of faith was two years, you know, like my, that my bit, my, my launch to business took a decade, you know, because it's the emotional and the mental parts of it that really deserve more of the exercising and the, you know, experimenting and and trusting and trusting yourself. So how did you get to that trusting point with yourself? Like, you know, because quitting is one thing. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned also like the financial aspect of things. Like I just need to pay my rent and get by. (laughs) So there, there, there is some, some elements of almost desperation, you know, but at the same time, you're eager, you're in it because you, you could have left real estate at any point if you think about it. Like this whole industry is not for me, but something was, you know, holding you in and now you're a TC. So what's happening with your mind and in your, in your life at this point? Yeah, absolutely. So it also took me a long time to actually get ready. (laughs) Whenever I started seriously thinking about starting my own company, it from serious idea to fruition was about six months. Okay. A lot of that was fear driven. Like actually the process to start the company is, was not that difficult, you know, but it was mental blocking. It was fear. 
it was dragging my feet, you know, cause I was still doing something else. And there were so many times I went back and forth on what I should do. And so it really took a lot, but I think it was, you know, I wasn't in a place where I felt like I could grow. And I was like, what's the next step where I can grow. And for me, after all these little steps, like you said, where I learned more from each experience and I kind of slowly and slowly got more off on my own towards like being an entrepreneur full time, each of those little steps kind of helped guide me and make me like a little less scared. But when I first quit the assistant job, I researched being a full-time transaction coordinator, like starting my own company from scratch. And I had a lot of ideas for it, but to me, I was like, I've never just done TC full-time. So I don't know if this is the right fit. And so I kind of found a middle ground of working for a company as a contractor, as a TC. And then after enough of that, it was like, okay, now I really know how to do this. And you start to, I think maybe when you start to think like at a job, like I would do it this way or it should be done this way, you know, or, you know, I really, I wish it was being handled this way. If you start to think of that more and more and your experience level is there, then you're like, okay, wait, why don't I actually do it this way on my own? So those were a lot of the thoughts I was having at that time when I seriously got serious about doing my own thing. Yeah. Again, another key right there, just you stepping back and realizing I don't like the way they're running their business. <laughs> yeah. Basically. Mm-hmm. But then it, it can be scary when you don't have the, the footing or the foundation of what running a business actually looks like. And and even, you know, when you mentioned how people fall into that nine to five mindset when they are their own technically already a business, as soon as you become an independent, independent contractor, I tell people, even through like my, my the coaching I do with people or when I was getting coached, like, no, you are a business the moment even if it's not written or legalized, the fact that you said you're going to do this independent, that's day one, day zero, you have started. And that's also like a sign of you're ready just for some sort of change Mm -hmm. because you're getting antsy and then you start to, that then the confidence starts to kick in. So between that point of like, I could do it better or I wish they were doing it this way. How did you get your first independent contract? I mean, independent file or transaction, or was it many or, or cl- a client? When I was like, when I went fully on my own, is that what you mean? Yeah. So yeah. you then transitioned into, I'm going to do this independently. Do you remember your first transaction a- alone? Gosh, I'm trying to think. Well, so luckily when I transitioned from contractor to being like the owner of my business, I had existing clients I was able to take with me. So that was a huge part that was comforting. I did lose a lot of people too, though. So probably cut my income in like half or more, but having some type of starting point, you know, where it's like, okay, from day one, though, the business was profitable. That was huge for me. Um, Um, But yeah, I remember when I got my very first client on my own ever, though, I had been doing it for about six months and I had some clients from like random sources. But when I got my first person, person. It was someone I'd known years ago in the industry. We actually started at the brokerage together. And then we, you know, obviously eh, very smallly stayed in touch over the years. And then one day she just reached out to me. I had been posting on Facebook. That was kind of my primary thing at the time. So I feel like all the real realtors love Facebook. If you didn't yeah. know, already. <laughs> but that was huge. And that kind of gave me, I remember I'd set a goal that year to get like three new clients on my own. And it ended up turning into like 20. And wow. so that's just felt like that one, like it was such a manifestation. Like when I went back and looked at those goals, like the income goal I sat, I, I set, I tripled the client goal. I like quadruple, I don't even know what's past quadruple, but you know, so like, so really sitting that's down, just, yeah. those intentions, I was like, Oh my goodness, when I was able to look back on it. But yeah, the first one came from like some Facebook and like a personal connection, which I think everybody has a personal connection to people in the real estate industry. Like there's so many agents out there, people who work in different parts of the industry. So getting your foot in the door with one after that, it really becomes a word of mouth situation. Exactly, exactly. And that's, that's similar to how my business took off as well. It's just you gotta just start with the one. Yes. And honor that one as if it's a hundred. And, and I, I really do. I really do believe that the trust is built through our actions and, yes. and it could be the most subtle of responses. Like, Oh, I noticed Allison responds like within the first hour of, of my emails or first five minutes, whatever the case. And 
I'm I'm pretty sure that's that also played a factor, but you also were very intentional. So it's like it, you weren't just setting the intention and sitting there and waiting. Like yeah. you, were still, <laughs> you were still doing the work. So for anyone out there that is thinking, oh, I just have to set the intention and, and it'll come to me. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that's what she did, but I just want I want to like clear that up for people because this is the real estate is not a waiting around game. Yeah. You have mm-hmm. to get up and hustle and grind and of course take care of yourself, but but it is possible. Absolutely. And, and so now you're in it, you're in it. And so how's your confidence at this point? And like, are you starting to catch your stride and and be like, okay, it's this, definitely this is my getting, thing now. <laughs> yes. It's definitely getting much better, but then you almost like, I like what you said earlier, it's like, everything's a setback. Then you get hit with the tidal wave of I've never done this much at once. Yes. How often do I handle this many files, this many clients, this many closings at once. And so then it's like, you lose confidence, kind of get knocked down again on just like, how am I going to do all this? Mm-hmm. And then you go through a learning period of, you know, figuring out how to handle that. And then you get to a point where you're handling that like no problem. Right. And so it's really, if you scale really fast though, I like what you said about, you know, even if it's one client treating it like a hundred or giving it a hundred, because that's advice I would give as well. It's like, even if you have one client or one closing act, like you have a hundred closings, you know, this month or this quarter or whatever, and then work that way. Right. Don't mm-hmm. just lollygag or, you know, you know, not take a shortcut or not have like templates and systems in place. Cause you don't have that much going because mm-hmm. then when you do get super busy, you're going to have to learn the hard way instead of having systems in place. So that was definitely another hurdle I kind of had to overcome. So I'm getting more confident in what I'm doing slowly, but surely, but then I got step back a little bit, like, okay, now how do I do this many at one time? So it's always kind of like one hurdle after another. But then once I got through that hurdle, ever since then, the confidence has been pretty steady. Yeah. I mean, right. Like, I think that's the best when people ask me, cause I'm pretty sure you get a lot of questions too. I want to start, I want to do this. Cause they just see the glamorous parts of it. I'm putting air quotes up, but yes. <laughs> they just see, you know, I work from home. I, you know, I can post on social media for a living. I do all this, but it's like, (laughs) this is ongoing. This is, I'm on repeat. I'm doing the same 1000 tasks in one week and then applying it the next week. (laughs) And um, no, and and I tell that to people all the time. I'm like, well, if you want to get started, even if you don't have any clients, get your systems in order because the moment it takes off, you really could go from zero to a hundred real quick. Yeah, and, and then at least then you're already prepared for it when it slows down. You remembered, oh yeah, this is what I was doing when it slowed down, but when it took off, oh thank God I had my systems in order, my checklist, and you're staying on top of things. And now you, so now you're independent. You are doing things. How are you keeping track of things? Like, what is your productivity looking like in terms of systems or organization, time management? Is this still, like, I know you mentioned having wished you'd done some of it in the beginning, but again, like, what was that moment where you're like, okay, as long as I keep these things in order, I can move forward. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think the biggest thing, number one is prioritizing. Yeah. Because I think, and you learn from mistakes along the way, right? So like, I used to keep all my transaction deadlines. I, I still do this. I keep them as task. So that I kind of, I can check them the same place. I check all my other tasks in addition to like where the deadlines are. And I just like missed one, one time. And I was like, and it, luckily it was fine, but it, the agent was upset about it. And it's like, how can I never do that again? And so ever since that day, every single morning, the first thing I do is check on all my deadlines. I'll send out text or email reminders, whatever the agent and I preferences are. I'll just follow up on something if that's what that is. And that's the first thing I do every morning, no matter what, absolutely. And the biggest thing I see with like other TCs or if I've had, you know, something and someone had to cover my files and something didn't go well, it's like, it's all about prioritizing, right? So for me, it's like, my morning routine. And then I do really believe in time blocking, but it can't be the same every day because it is real estate. It's like never the same, but the morning routine is deadlines, emails, and then high priority items are those fires that need to be put out. And if you're working efficiently, you can have all that done easily within the first hour. And then you can work on your new contracts because those are probably pressing. And then after that, it's kind of like, okay, what else needs my attention? 
you know, but I prioritize the deadlines. That's probably number one in a real estate transaction. Any like fires that need to be put out, answer people's emails from the night before the weekend. And then I've, you know, started on the new contracts. So figuring out, you know, what is really important and getting those things done earlier in the day. And, you know, sometimes you might not have a new contract, so then you can just move on to the next thing, or you might not have a fire to put out ideally. Right. Right. And then you can move on to the next thing. So I think it's really about prioritizing is all it's about, because once you get to having a hundred tasks to do a day, you're not going to finish every single one. So it's really just having the priorities in place and then systems that support that. Yeah. And, and again, it goes back to being prepared even in the beginning of your career, right. And just having that, those systems in place. And I like how you said your morning routine is pretty much the most vital part in in a sense, because you really can get a lot done if you stay efficient and on top of things and, and you're still working solo, right. You're still doing all of this alone. And, yeah. mm-hmm. and since then, how, what is the, are you in your third or fourth year or fifth year right now? So I'm in my fourth year. Yes. Fourth year. So all mm-hmm. of this is still occurring in the very first year of you, you just trial and error, trial and error. And like, probably like the first year, year, year and a half. And then probably about a year and a half to two years in is when I started like really figuring it out. Got it. Okay. So keep that in mind for anyone out there listening, yeah. interested <laughs> in becoming a TC. Or just take my advice too. Like, don't make the mistakes we did. Exactly. Exactly. Cause I definitely, I think I spent the first couple of years trying to build systems cause I've, I'd come from an office. So I'd worked that nine to five, you know, I just was input. I was put into a system. Whereas like when you're alone, Oh crap. You have to create the system. You have to create yeah. the system. So I think I spent the first year and a half doing that until I burnt out and was just like, I'm over it. I don't, I give up. But then I thank God I gave it one more chance, but, but no, absolutely. For anyone out there, or even if you're in the thick of it, Again, rewind this part of the episode, pause it, bookmark it, but take notes also because everything Allison said, I know everyone works differently and has energy at different parts of the day, but there's something about that morning routine that is so crucial and just sets the precedence of like how the day is going to function or even how the transaction is going to function. I've, I don't know if you've noticed, but when I, however a transaction starts is like, oh, I already know it's going to be... <laughs> hell on earth I'm just like oh my god I've done this so many times <laughs> what is going on on the back end mm-hmm. so so how how have you managed that just you know building your systems and you know failure is the best way towards creating those systems unfortunately you yeah. have to mess up to know where your blind spots are and whatnot but now that you've caught you know you ha- you caught your stride you're in it you're in motion things are happening so how are you now managing Or even in the beginning, how have you managed all the different energies and people involved and those that have experience, those that don't, how is that for you? So I think something I like working with all kinds of agents, like I like even like a newbie, but that's because I can answer their questions. I think if you're like getting started, maybe that's not the best client for you, but really like any experience you've had in any job. So if this is someone's second or third or fourth career, you've worked with other personalities. And the agent I worked for as assistant had like a very specific personality type. And so learning to work with that kind of personality and like all the other personalities from working with buyers and sellers and working with other agents in the office, you learn over time how to work with those kind of personalities. So even if you, you know, even if you're young or if you further on in your career, like you've been around other personalities and you learn more and more how to work with those kind of people. And then you just have to tailor what you're doing to that person. So I think some people get caught too, too much in the system. Like, no, I'm going to send this email for this and do this. And it's like, you know, some of these agents are never going to check their email, like, or they're never going to answer the phone because they work different ways and different personality types, or some do really well. If you call them once a week and they want to have that one-to-one phone time with you, some of them are just like, I'm so busy, text me everything, or just don't talk to me unless something's on fire, you know? So you learn while working with them. A lot of people say it takes like three transactions to get into a groove with someone. So I think that's a good expectation to set too. Like, okay, we're going to try our best to have a good onboarding call and do good. And, you know, we can reevaluate in a couple transactions because sometimes it takes some time to get in a groove. So 
even if it's your first time working with someone, give it a couple transactions um, before you like get discouraged. You'll learn more about them. And now I can just spot someone's personality type. So I don't even have to do a transaction with them. I can do one call with them. And I'm like, okay, this is what this agent's oh. going to be like because I've worked <laughs> with so many. Yes. But you'll kind of start to pick up that more and more. I feel like agents fall into like a couple different buckets, primarily on their personality types and how they like to work. And then you'll pick up on their small nuances over the couple transactions. And as you move on and then you eventually become a well-oiled machine. But I think it's important that if you really want to provide good customer service and be agent friendly, you might not be able to use your perfect system all the time, right? Like a lot of TCs love emailing, but if I'm really missing something from an agent or we have a five o'clock deadline, it's four o'clock, I need to text or call them, you know? So figuring that out as well is like, if you haven't worked with agents before or been an agent, you know, figuring out, okay, maybe email is not the best medium or phone calls, not the best medium or however it is. Is. you'll figure it out in general and then also that kind of narrows it down as you keep working with people more yeah no I totally agree and and also make notes next to the people you onboard whether you've done one transaction with them or many you know Absolutely. because again like you said you don't know if the agent prefers phone text email and I've noticed even so with some clients early on is that they have like set times when they make phone calls. So I'm like, oh, I keep getting the same phone call from them at 3, 3 p.m. every day. Yeah. So make a note of that. Maybe like block out time for, you know, agent XYZ, you know what I mean? And what also stood out to me just now is a lot of what Allison said is can apply to other parts of business, not just transaction coordination. And I don't know if you feel like this, but I feel like real estate has been a vehicle towards other paths in my career and in my business and having kind of, like you said, your your own set system, but being agile at the same time. But how do you feel in terms of confidence when it comes to starting new projects or doing other things with within real estate, whether it's now or in the future? Do you think that transaction coordination has kind of set that foundation for you? I think it definitely helps like with any job change, pulling experience from something else and experiences and more confidence. And a lot of that's working with people, right. And understanding things like that. Um, but still, anytime I start something new, like I'll feel super confident at the beginning and then I get hit with a wave of doubt and then I'll be pretty confident, but I'll always have those moments of like, no, I can't do this. Absolutely not. So, and that's something I've kind of learned though, is so normal mm -hmm. and those are probably like 5% of the time. And then like 95% of the time I feel confident. So it's like, okay, that's what's most important. Like everyone's going to have low points where you doubt yourself, especially if you're doing something new or like once a day in being an entrepreneur, you like, you're like, everything's horrible. And the next minute it's like the best day ever. So it's like, I think having, knowing that that's normal and just trying to block out those negative thoughts, like literally like, like flick it out of the way. Like when you feel it coming into your brain, like get rid of it. But then also realizing if you have a day where those are consuming you more, mm -hmm. maybe that's not a day you work on a new project. Like I had a day kind of like that last week, just with some of my regular stuff I do. And I was like, okay, I'm just not going to work on it anymore today. And then the next day without even really working too much, my mindset, I woke up and I felt way better about it. So it's like realizing that it's going to ebb and flow for everyone, especially if you're doing something new doing something on your own for the first time. And so I think that's something I've heard from other entrepreneurs and people. It's like, it's okay to have a bad day or a bad thought or something, um, but you've got to focus mostly on having a positive mindset. And I, like a quote I like is not, you know, what happens if it doesn't work out? Like what happens if it does? So thinking of your life that way, you know, this big goal or project, like you probably think if X, Y, Z happens and I hit this income goal or I make this many sales or something, then it's like, my life's going to change in this way. Think about it that way instead of what if it doesn't, you know? Yeah, no, definitely. That It's like that opportunity mindset versus just that, that lack mentality or that scarcity mindset. It's like, we have the power to flip things on its head and, and think the complete opposite because for, I think, but I think we're conditioned like for so long, whether it's just trauma or experience or lack of experience. And we, we tend to operate in that, that lack first, but no, you're right. It, 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 we do have that power to just think positively. And was that brought on from like books or reading or just a lot of failure, a mentor coaching? How, how do you maintain that, that mindset? 
I'm a big reader and I'm a big podcast listener. So I think working from home by yourself, you have a lot of time to like listen to podcasts. So I love some of my like funny podcasts, but then I also really try to listen to some like other entrepreneurs a lot. And I feel like anytime I listen to those, I write down at least some type of note that I take from it. So podcasting, especially while you're working, I think is great. You can listen to this podcast, um, any of the <laughs> action care podcasts, but also reading. Yeah. And I, I love reading for fun and also for like personal development. So, you know, have just that and then also like I try to to some extent stay in my own little bubble like not accept too much negativity like I can tell when I've been on social media for too long or I went too deep reading comments on something I'm like why am I reading these people being rude to someone I don't even know for no reason like why did I just waste five minutes doing that and now I feel negative so kind of like blocking out things that I know bring in negativity and then also taking in resources from as much positivity um, sources as I can so doesn't mean it's perfect all the time but yeah trying to just have that positive mindset and I think going into your morning mindset too whatever that looks like for you setting up for a positive mindset for the day is huge yeah, no, I definitely have to put myself on social media timeouts, right? Create these boundaries because I get I get caught up too. Like especially if something's trending, I'm just like, oh, what did they say? What did they say? Yes. <laughs> it's very, and, but it's but at the same time, it's okay to just not always be in business mode and be in. Okay. You you definitely need those outlets, some of that escapism for a little bit, but a little too much can, it can definitely distract you from the main goals and priorities of that day, whether it's your work or your family, friends, whatever the case. But speaking of social media, again, I mentioned that I've not found, but I just, you know, learned who you were on social media, especially YouTube. Again, as we mentioned, we tried to go live together on YouTube and Hey, listen to this podcast. It's fine. Listen to the podcast. It's fine. Listen to this episode. But is that you going on social media? Was that a part of the plan? Or because I know some people don't use social media, they're not comfortable with it. And I know you have a marketing background, but what was the the thought process be- behind incorporating now? I'm going to basically become now a social media department because when you think about it, this is a full time job. Yeah. Staying on top of things, especially if you're working by yourself. So how are you now weaving this into your business? Totally. So the first thing I did when I ever became an independent contractor as a TC was I started my YouTube channel and my, now I'm like, I don't even know why I did that, but I'm happy I did. But I, my first thought was like, this could be a good way to make, you know, long form videos. I think also I was a little, maybe embarrassed or worried about posting on my personal pages like Facebook and Instagram when I was first starting out, you know, because technically this was the first time I went on my own as a TC. So it's like, you don't want people to be like, oh, she just started this or whatever. I think be more self-conscious of people, you know, watching your content than people you don't know. And so I just had this idea that I thought YouTube could be a good place to market myself. And then I did start sharing the videos on my personal Facebook, just because I had such a real estate heavy background that so so many real estate agents were seeing them. And my first client, like we talked about earlier, she had just been seeing it, you know, over the past like six to eight months. And then eventually kind of reminded her to reach out. So I think it's really important for staying in front of people. It's not like you're going to post and then immediately get a new client. It's more about, for me, it was more about if someone Googles me, is it going to look like I have a legit online presence? And then also, you know, being able to just stay in front of people when I I don't want people to see me and then immediately like want to call me and hire me. It's more like, Oh yeah. And then someone asks about a TC, someone else at the brokerage and they remember, Oh yeah, I always see this girl's stuff on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. But I only fully started my Instagram, like less than six months ago. Cause I think it's also important not to overwhelm yourself. So I started getting a lot of traction on YouTube and then I was still sharing on Facebook, eventually made a Facebook business page. And I was kind of like, okay, I feel like this is pretty good. Honestly, I feel like a lot of my ideal client stuff aren't necessarily on Instagram, but I feel like that's kind of just a part of, okay, I have Facebook, Instagram, and like YouTube. And then I have like a Pinterest that I'm still trying to figure out too. I'm not doing TikTok. I know I probably should, but I'm like, I don't even have a personal TikTok. So I can't go down that rabbit hole right now of trying to learn something totally new. So I think starting with platforms that I was familiar with. And like I said, I kind of tried to like master one before I moved on to the next one. And so like Instagram's not my biggest, but if someone wants to click on Instagram and find me, then I want to be in places where people can find me. But yeah, I kind of started with one and then slowly grew it from there. 
Yeah, no, definitely like having that online presence is important, but I'm glad you said that you focus on one or two platforms first because it is very overwhelming. And I think it's just now clicking for me how I want to show up on every platform because I'm I'm an Aries, so I can be very impulsive and be very like, let's do it all at once, you know? Mm-hmm. And then fast forward six weeks later, I'm like, throw it all in the trash. That's I'm, how you get burnt out. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. how you get burnt out. So I feel like in the last couple of years, I've I'm starting to find my own stride with social media and and not getting caught up in always giving, giving, giving. It's like, well, I can also help on the background by just commenting and liking and reposting. I don't always have to be the face of everything, you know, and everyone's consuming so much content on a daily basis. It's like, where do I fit in in all this? And, and yeah, I had that same, I have that same experience where I kind of just wanted to start over with not hearing or seeing certain voices of people I knew. So I was like, let me just and and that was YouTube and TikTok for me. I was just like, well, there are no familiar voices or energies over there. So let me just get a clean slate and start over. But I agree too. It's like that long form content can also be used for smaller posts and to repurpose later. But if someone asks you like, should, do I need social media for my business? What would you say? That's kind of tough. Cause I feel like um, honestly, my first response is no. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I also, because sometimes people ask me if they need a website and my first response is also no, but right. I feel like maybe you need one or the other at least, right? Like you need some type of online presence in case someone Googles you, in my opinion, just something. So if you don't want to pay for a website and everything, then have a business Facebook page. If you're not comfortable on social media and you're more comfortable building a website, maybe have a website. So having something for online presence, but like I said, it really it depends on how you want to run your business, right? Do you want to be really word of mouth heavy? Do you want to be cold calling agents? Do you want to be going actually out in person in your community and doing stuff? Because I think a lot of people like this job because they can work from home. And so social media and the internet make it easier to market yourself that way without having to go out and do more like old school boots on the ground marketing. So I think it really depends on like how you want to run your business. If you're really not comfortable on social then in you're okay going out the community or calling people, or you have a huge network of people you can already market to directly, then no, you, I don't necessarily think so. And I don't think you need to have a perfectly curated platform on every platform. Some of them like Facebook and Instagram, make it easy to share the same content. So you're not having to create all kinds of stuff, but yeah, I think not necessarily, but it does help for sure. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I I agree too. It's like sometimes just buy your domain, whatever your business name is, just buy it, yeah. make sure it's available. And then you could link that to anything. It could go to your YouTube, it could go to your LinkedIn, whatever the case. But that brings me to my next question. What are your thoughts on AI, artificial, artificial intelligence and in the real estate world and as a TC? Yeah. So I've dabbled in it like a tiny, tiny bit. Like I probably don't know very much. I saw, I like tried to see if it could like help like outline a blog post. And so like, it definitely worked, but then you have to go in and tweak it. But like I said, I'm really, really, I've tried it maybe like one or two times. I used to work with an agent who started using it and they would use it to help them write like the property description. I'm an agent, another agent actually do that the other day. And so like, it get, helps give you some ideas. And I think like if you're having a time block and st- or a mental block it helps kind of work through that a little bit or help you. I don't really know too much about it. I think it can probably do a lot, but in terms of real estate, I was actually having this conversation with my step stepmother-in-law last night. And she was saying, some people say it's going to like take over and like do all this stuff. And it was like, I'm like, well, I guess if that happens, we'll all figure out what we're going to do. But to me, real estate is so personal Every single transaction is so different. And I'm sure these AI computers are really smart, but there's so many, if this, then that, and then if this, then that, and that, and then that, and then, oh no, this person has a personal reason that they need to make this change or we need to do the transaction this way. So there's a lot of like human aspect to it. One, because it's usually an emotional transaction, unless it's an investor, which most of the time it's not an investor. These are people's personal homes. Doesn't matter if they have five homes, it's still emotional I've found. Mm -hmm. And so they're emotionally invested. It's exhausting. It's tiring. There's high emotions, high stakes financially, like 
the human element is, you know, it can see how it hinders it in some ways, but it also, that's what's there when someone calls you upset at midnight or something the night before closing, if you're an agent, like where they're really having something wrong, you know, the, having that human element is so important. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And yeah, I'm just imagining someone in the middle of the night. Hold on, let me let me get my my AI going first. <laughs> yeah, like if your baby is sick, so then you can't make it to closing on time. Like, how do you tell the computer like to comfort you and fix it? Like, I don't know. Or your movers showed up early. Like, I don't know how <laughs> this is supposed to work. But exactly, it doesn't try to prove me too wrong anytime soon. So. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I definitely don't see it replacing people in, in all the way. I definitely think it will enhance certain jobs or even editing, like you said, with the descriptions and things like that. But I think it's just like enhancing your skills. Just yeah. learn the AI. If, if that's something you're interested, in, then learn it and make it a part of your business. If, if you feel scared about doing it, and I'm, I'm just speaking generally, you know, gen just generally speaking. Because I, I have people asking me or I've seen posts online about AI and I just imagine a time when the internet first came out. I'm about to be 40. So it's like I've seen both worlds. Mm -hmm. I've seen a world without the internet. I've seen a world with the internet. <clears throat> and now I'm living in a world with the internet, AI and social media, smartphones. It's 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 a lot and it can be overwhelming. But I think if it's something that you're intimidated by or not sure about, just try it, learn it. Ask I feel like there's parts of it we can leverage to, to our advantage. So exactly. not be afraid of it. Exactly. Exactly. So as we wrap up this conversation again, second, second, the best, first, the worst, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you again for being on here. I do have a few last questions, but talk to me about, like expansion for your business. Do you see that in the future or are you good with where you're at? If you don't mind just sharing what, what yeah, you're Absolutely. No, I, I definitely have like the entrepreneurship, like expansion mindset mindset. I'm always thinking about ways to grow the business. And I have some like actual like goals and ideas I'm really working on right now. I want to expand my team. I don't want to just be a one woman show. Something I had the privilege of doing at my previous company was mentoring newer TCs or people who are just new to the company. And I absolutely love doing that. I think that's why a lot of my YouTube videos have taken on more of a advice or tutorial for newer TCs or people getting started because I'm really passionate about that because there's not a lot of training out there. And I know you feel the same way. Like, and I'm really passionate about realtors, like realizing the value of a good TC. And I think because there's not a lot of training, like it's not necessarily these other TCs fault. Like if you don't have a little real estate experience, you haven't had a mentor, you have, you don't just have, you know, 900, almost a thousand transactions on your belt. Like that's how many I had to do to learn all this, you know, exactly. it's like, you it's hard like you're not not for lack of effort not for lack of trying not for you know lack of knowledge it's really just there's not the training and the experience so that's kind of what has pursued me to want to you know bring people onto my team who are maybe newer that I can mentor and help in that way and then continue to grow the business that way and well as well and that's also why I have like the YouTube and the coaching part of my business which I want to grow more hopefully by the end of the year or something and so just having more resources for people people are always asking me for that kind of information and stuff like that. So being able to help people in that as aspect, I really get a lot of joy out of it. And I think there's not a lot of it out there. So helping people, you know, I think in my bio, it said make a name for themselves. Like, you know, you can learn with the right resources. TC can be the most integral part of the transaction. So making sure as a whole, we're holding ourselves to a higher industry standard. That's kind of what fuels me. So I want to build out the team and then also build out more of those support resources, like the coaching programs I have for everyone. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. And you got to put it out there. You got to tell the people whether it's here or on your own platform, like let them know what you need. And yeah. you have shown and proved that the manifestation plus the work and preparation definitely pays off and it works. So with that said, what is, and you know, with your growing experience and your career flourishing and things and I, you know, sending you all the good vibes and energy to, that it all comes true and happens. What is something you are glad you did starting out? And then what is something you wish you had done starting out now that you have gotten here? Oh my goodness. Okay. I'm trying to think something I wish I 
something I'm glad I did, and then something I wish I'd done. So I think something I'm glad I did, which I think maybe it's just kind of part of my whole journey was like what we talked about earlier, like recognizing the pain points, realizing there was more to learn and not being ashamed of that. You know, I didn't necessarily like take a pay cut when I changed a job. But if you think of the unlimited income potential as an agent, then technically I did. But being able to sit back for a little bit and do that and really learn to propel me to where I am today, I think also not having super unrealistic expectations. Like I set those goals for myself and I was excited and I was intentional about them and, you know, making a plan. Something I wish I did do, I think there's another part of the conversation we already had, which is more just like treating it like a business. Like Mm -hmm. I've been an independent contractor since, you know, six or eight weeks, whatever it was out of college, I quit my insurance job. But I feel like I did not truly start acting like a business owner for a few more years until I fully went off on my own and started stitched real estate. Like I was never acting like a business owner. And so I think that's a great conversation that we had earlier is, you know, if you're just an independent contractor or freelancer, or you do start your own LLC or whatever the case may be, like you are, or you're just a real estate agent listening to this, you're running your own business. Like actually you're an entrepreneur. So I think I wish I would have recognized that earlier. Maybe I would have put some other like systems in place or whatever inspired me in some different ways, but we made it here without it. So that's probably what I would change. I love it. I love it. And thank you again. This has been awesome. I do have one last question, but yeah, I'm, 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 I paused because I was like, I'm like really motivated and inspired. Even just, even though we've had this similar conversation already, it's just nice to hear it. Like you're not alone. We are not alone in this, this field, in this industry. And there are like-minded people out there and not having that shame you know, not being afraid to say, Hey, I don't know what I'm doing, or I got this far. What do I do next? You know, I think some of us tend to hold in those questions or in fear that we'll get fired or replaced, whatever the case. And sometimes you, we need to get fired or quit to figure out who we def, who we are and how much uh, strength and power we have. But you have dropped so many keys and just so many gems this whole episode. I'm so grateful to have you on the show. And I would definitely love to have you again as we, you know, get more deep into the conversations and the specificities of, of the running a business, being a TC. But thank you for sharing your story, your journey. And I'm just curious, how do you care for yourself outside of work? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for having me. Uh, It's been a great conversation. So I would love to be back. I'm excited. But I really try to stick to a certain work schedule. It can be hard as an entrepreneur. Trust me, I sometimes wake up at 1130 or like right before I laid on the bed and I make a bunch of notes in my phone. And my (laughs) husband tried to talk to me and I'm like, shh. Like, no, and I'm having like a brainstorm thought. I'm like, nobody can talk to me until I get all these notes written down. Or like in the shower, I'm like, I need a like shower proof notepad because that's where all my good ideas come from. (laughs) I'm definitely guilty of sometimes, you know, 7.30 in the morning or late at night, like checking on something. But for the most part, I try to work within normal working hours. And I think in our last conversation, we touched on this a little bit, but I tell the clients I'm available between nine and five. That does not mean I'm always working between nine and five, but working, you know, as an entrepreneur, there's always something to be doing, trying to keep those things within those hours while I'm already available for clients. And then when my family is off or it's like a weekend, you know, not having to worry about work. So trying to, even though you can work anytime and using air quotes again, whenever you want, you know, having some set boundaries in place, I think is huge. Also for me, like I mentioned my morning routine with work, but my morning routine in general. So exercise is big for me getting enough sleep you know going to bed early but being able to wake up early enough I just am always been a morning person most productive in the morning so getting up at the right time exercising to clear my head for the day I am working on being better about my meditation and like mantras and things like that but I don't always hit those every day but when I do I just feel so much better and then and that can be whatever that is for you right but I think doing something in the morning before real estate gets crazy because you can have a perfectly structured day or you can have a day that's like a tornado so having getting my things that mean something to me over with in the morning then I'm ready to like tackle the rest of the day and then after work and really you know monitoring monitoring how much we're on social media, like we talked about earlier, because I think sometimes it's good and it's a distraction. And then sometimes it can be negative. 
negative or like a time suck. So trying to watch that is something I'm working on being better about. And then I also mentioned I love reading because that's off social media time. It's kind of like watching a show, but like you get to live in an own little world for a little bit where I really don't think about work. Whereas on social media, I'm friends with so many of the realtors too. So you'll see, oh, we just sold this house. And it's like, okay, there's a new contract for tomorrow. So now I'm thinking about work again. So trying to put the social media and the phone away. I'm also really passionate about using like the do not disturb settings on my phone. So I really like on the iPhone, they have like a personal one. And I have that just set up for like my closest friends and family. So I don't get alerts for anything else if it's after work on a weekend. So I think really creating boundaries for yourself and then finding those ways to enjoy other aspects of your life. And then also setting up the right mindset. Those are the things I do that work really well for me. I love it. I love it. So I hope everyone listening has taken notes and apply and will apply them immediately because you like I said, you dropped a lot of gems, a lot of keys. And I enjoyed this conversation and I do hope to have you back again. We'll talk about other things, but tell the people how they could follow you, work with you, websites, YouTube, all the good stuff. Go go for it. Yeah, absolutely. So most people know my YouTube channel, which is at Stitch Real Estate. So definitely head there and subscribe if you're interested. For people that already love my videos, I do have a Patreon kind of platform where you get four extra videos a month. So you can definitely check more information about that out on our website. Our website stitchedre.com. Also, I am on Instagram as at Stitch Real Estate and Facebook as at Stitch Real Estate. But yeah, head to our website it has information about our services if you're interested in working with us or if you're someone who is a newer TC, you're just looking for a change. Like I said, I am going to be expanding my team. So definitely contact me through one of the socials or there's a contact form on our website and then maybe we can get in touch about that. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And all of her information will be in the description of this episode. So just scroll through it, click on it, reach out, follow, subscribe, all that good stuff. But again, thank you again for being on the show. I truly appreciate it. New episodes are released every Monday for the Transaction Care Podcast show. Go to transactioncarepodcast.com to subscribe and listen to past episodes. And if you want to be on the show, message me. I have an email that will be in the description below. I can't remember it off the top of my head right now because I just made, I just made it over the weekend. But I will insert that in the description for you all to reach out. So then if you have topics you want me to discuss, we can do that. But until then, this has been another episode of the Transaction Care Podcast. My name is Lillian Hernandez, a.k.a. Lily Like the Flower. New episodes are released every Monday. I'm giving you the keys. There are no gatekeepers here. Care for yourself. Care for your wealth. Your time is worth it. Let's coordinate. Talk soon. <laughs>